Thank you so much for being with us today. What a joy it is to come into your home, your place of business, your nursing home, your hospital bed, wherever you may be watching the telecast today. I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for praying for us. You encourage our heart. We've heard from so many people. We were even in Europe and heard from some people that we met that they watched the television program in the Carolinas. And we just thank the Lord for all of you that are faithful to view. I hope you'll take time to call a friend or share with them. Tell them to set their DVD and be a part of Restore the Landmarks telecast. Will you go now with us inside as we study the word together? And let's keep rejoicing as we pray for revival in America. But all of this blood and all of this rioting and all of this is now coming back to the surface because we're going against what was already accomplished in the Word of God. Look what it says here. Is there a surge in anti-Semitic conduct? Well, if you follow the flags and you follow the illustrations and you follow the notes around the world, you say that there is a revival. We see uh, Jewish flags being desecrated. We see signs being desecrated. We see the symbols being taken that there will be no more Jew, that we will eradicate them. What did the Bible say in Psalms 83? I just read that to you. What did the Iranians say? The reason they wanted atomic weapons. They wanted to push the Jews in the Mediterranean. How? Never to be remembered again. That sounds like Psalms 83 to me, ladies and gentlemen. Your Bible is ahead of the headlines. And you need to pay attention to the Word of God. Is there a biblical connection to the anti-Semitic conduct in America to the Word of God? Is there something that we can see as people of faith? Uh, and I really believe that one of the things we can follow is not only what's it written in the Word of God, but we also know that many have pushed the hate speech that Jews are Jesus killers, that Jews kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know from the Word of God that the Romans did not uh, have the power to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the Jewish court did not have the power to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loved you. Jesus loved me. And he gave his life that we could have life eternal. No man took it. So what about this hate speech that Jews killed Jesus. Well, I was at a conference at the Mayfield Hotel in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. And we took a break at the, at the meeting there. It was part of the peace negotiations. And uh, the Israelis invited me into the conference room. We were having some uh, coffee and pastries. We were sitting there talking. And one of them said, uh, Ralph, why do you like us? Why, why, do you, uh, why are you friends with us? We've heard all our life that you hate us because we're Jews, we're Christ killers. And I said, well, you know what? That's not true. I said, Jews didn't kill Christ. And I said, we understand that. We, uh, we know that. And he said, man, I've been told all my life. That's why uh, church people, Christians, they don't like us. We kill their Christ. And I said, you couldn't kill Christ any more than I could kill Christ. I said, there's not a Roman army can nail him to a tree and there's not a Jewish court that can nail him to a tree. Jesus did not get killed by Jews. And then he got so excited, he called four or five guys over. The next thing I know, there's 10 or 12, and then there's 20 something. They're all standing around. Hey, Ralph's saying that Jews didn't kill Jesus. We've never heard that. And I got to tell them. And what did I tell them during that break? I got to tell them, we found out who it was. You did? Who was it? Who, who, who killed him? And I said, you're looking at him. I'm the guy. I killed him. I said, because I was sin, in sin, I was lost and undone. And Jesus loved sinners and he gave his life just like he loved me. He loved you. And I was able to share with them the plan of salvation right there. That Jesus died. He gave himself. And so... Uh, is there unreasonable hate connected to these biblical, biblical prophecies? Ladies and gentlemen, there is. Deuteronomy 7, 6, look what it says. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord God, thy God hath what? Has chosen you. 
And so we know that. Look at the next part. And he said, chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. What are you going to do with that? God said, I chose them. I picked them above all peoples. And then look at verse seven. God did not love you or choose you because of your what? Great numbers? No, ye were the fewest of all people. Go to Deuteronomy verse eight, seven and verse eight. Uh, because what? The Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And that's exactly what God did. God brought them out and God has established them. And one way you can tell prophetic time is to know that God doesn't use a calendar. God doesn't use a watch. God uses the nation of Israel. And if God is dealing with Israel, then the prophetic clock is counting down. And the more Israel's in the news, then the closer we are to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Zechariah chapter 2 and verse number 8. And look what God said in his word. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, for he that toucheth you, toucheth what? The apple of his eye. Have you ever put your finger in your eye and, uh, and touched your eyeball? That's not a good feeling. And God said, when you go against the Jew, you're putting your finger in God's eye. Amen. That's how he described the pain. That's what it does to him. So when we see these people making speeches, I thought about Roseanne Barr. She's still alive. She's breathing oxygen. Her blood's still circulating. But what's she going to do in a few hours or a few days when she steps out of this world, walks into the next world, and God gives her an accountability for what she said and for what she's done? You think about all the things that we face in our life. I will give an account. You will give an account. And that's why our words and our thoughts ought to be upon the things of God. That's why we ought to be built out of the word of God. God, my friend, wanted you to know how important this little nation of Israel is. And I want to ask you another question. Could this, part of this anti-Jew, anti-Israel rhetoric be fomented in the basic religious conflicts on this earth between good and evil? Could that not be a part of that hatred? Because one represents good, one represents evil. Let me give you an illustration. What are the two most hated countries on planet Earth? What? Israel and the United States. You're exactly right. Those are the two most hated countries in the world. And in 1776, what did our founding fathers build this nation on? They built it on the word of God. They even put a Bible verse on our Liberty Bell. They even carved in marble in our buildings that we're going to follow the Lord. They put Moses on our courthouses and the Ten Commandments because they said we're a nation of faith. We be believe the Old Testament, the Torah, and the New Testament, and we are going to build a country that will have moral values. 1948, May 14th, Israel becomes a nation. And you know what? They adopted their constitution and their, their uh, documents of originality. And you know what was their building block, their foundation? They said, we're going to build our country on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that'll be the block we'll build this nation on. And there's two countries in the world that are built on biblical principles. Two and only two. Israel and America. And those are the two most hated countries in the world. They receive the, the death threats, the terrorism, and all that happens. And I believe it goes back to a basic conflict between good and evil. That darkness fighting the light, that evil coming against the goodness that rides is up out. And think about our memorials. Is there a reason that when the protests were happening in 2020 and they were calling it social justice and it was being led by Antifa and other anti-Jewish organizations, 
and Black Lives Matter, and they were all forming against the government. Let's tear America down. Let's start it over. Let's tear up the Constitution. Let's get another one. What were they actually doing in the streets of Portland, in the streets of Seattle? They were piling up Bibles, pouring gasoline on Bibles and setting them on fire. That's not social justice. That's a struggle between darkness and light, good and evil. And that's what's fermenting underneath. That's what's boiling underneath. And you're the generation that has, God has loved you enough and given you enough opportunity that you can see it all come alive, that you'll know how close you are to the coming of the Lord. Go back to Genesis with me for a minute. Genesis chapter 3, go to verse 14. Look what the word of God says. He said, the Lord God said unto the serpent, thou art what? Cursed. Now go to verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He is talking about the serpent, the, the devil, the evil one, Lucifer, the wicked one, any name you want to give him. And what God is saying, there is going to be a struggle going on through the lives of men. And this bloodline that was appointed all the way back here in Genesis, there's going to be a redeemer. There's going to be a savior. There's going to be a Messiah. And we know him to be one that was born of a Jewish virgin girl right there in the little city of Nazareth. That's where she grew up, and that's where the stepfather would be found, Joseph, and they would travel to Bethlehem, and Jesus would be born in that city in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that he would be born of the house and lineage of David. Ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing this bloodline, and here it is. The bloodline of the promised Messiah is all Jewish, all Jewish, every bit of it. And God said, they would be my chosen people. Jesus Christ, look at John 3, 16. The begotten of God, who was born to a Jewish virgin. And so ladies and gentlemen, could part of this hatred be the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, if you go by race or people groups, he was Jewish. He kept the law. He had a bar mitzvah, remember? He was an observant Jew. You never find Jesus in a church on the New Testament. He's in a synagogue. He's preparing the way. And we see in the book of Acts, the apostle Peter in the first half, the apostle Paul in the second half. And we see God bring the gospel to the Jewish people, to the Gentile people through the Jewish people. Now, uh, let, let me quickly knock this out for you real quick. Let's go to Lucifer for just a moment. Let's go all the way back before Genesis. Lucifer rebelled against God. That's evil against good. All right? Then he's kicked out of heaven, right? He leaves heaven and he comes to earth. And you say, what do you mean he comes to earth? How do you think that serpent got in the garden? Huh? How do you think that serpent was there to talk to Eve? He had been banished from heaven. And the place of, his, uh, uh, of judgment was in planet earth. And we'll, we'll talk about that. We're getting ready to go through Genesis together. But we'll talk about the judgment on the earth and the place of darkness without form and void. And then look at number three. The enemy of God uh, and the enemy of God's son has become this darkness or this evil. And the enemy of God's people if you're going to follow that darkness through all the way back from that day to this day has been the wicked one, the evil of that dark side. Now, let's go to the Jerusalem Post for just a moment and look what it says. There's a revival of anti-Semitic conduct worldwide. And so they're quoting it. And it says, I, I, I was fascinated with this phrase. Pastor Mark, listen to what it said. He said that Israel, the nation, has become the world's Jew for the whole world to pick on. That like we see a Jew maybe uh, being set aside. You remember how Hitler made him wear a, a Star of David 
or they had to wear a sign or they would be excluded socially or whatever. And he said, this nation of Israel has become like a persecuted Jew, that the nation of Israel has been like a, one to be set aside, ostracized. Uh, do you know we have churches in America? Listen to this. You've got churches in America that are going to their conferences and passing resolutions not to do business with any company that has an office in Israel. Can you believe that? Did you know that? We got churches. They're doing that. They're actually, and you've got people putting pressure on boards uh, that have managing millions and billions of dollars to say, whatever you do, don't do a business with Israel. Don't spend money there. Don't help their startup company. And by the way, their Silicon Valley is outdoing our Silicon Valley because they are the world's leader in microprocessors and in computers. Do you know in the nation of Israel, they have three computers for every citizen. Three, they're the most computer-vested country in the world. And God said there's going to be a hatred, there's going to be an outcast going on, and I believe it's all against this very element of good and evil. You remember when I told you the Israelis gave me permission to do that message on Iron Dome? And when I say by permission, they allowed me to use the technical footage from the Iron Dome and show how it worked and intercepted. You remember all that? You remember in, in part of that message I said, and there's a futuristic part of this called David Slain? You remember me using that word? And I was fascinated that all of these weapon systems had Bible names. And I was fascinated. People made fun of the book of Ezekiel and the battle of Gog and Magog and the horsemen. And, and it said, and, uh, and what are you going to do? It talked about horsemen and chariots. Remember, and they mocked it, said, are, are we going back to the dark ages? And what did we discover in that research? We found out that the name of the number one battle tank in the world is Merkava. Merkava. And you know what that translated out of Hebrew to English? Chariot with horses. Huh? That God knew before the Bible was written down, they were going to name their battle tank like a chariot powered by the horsepower of a mighty engine. And that would be the battle tank. And you know what they put online this week? They finished the test for David Sling. What is David Sling? Laser guided that will intercept hypersonic missiles ahead of the entire world. Ladies and gentlemen, God wrote your Bible. You need to believe the Bible. You need to believe the Word of God. You need to be excited that the Lord's coming, and we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for the Jewish people. Uh, uh, and, and listen, five years ago, the ADL surveyed 53,000 people in 102 countries, and it produced the shocking results. In Gaza and the West Bank, 93% of all the people responded that they hated Jews. In Iraq itself, it said that 92% of the people hated Jews. In Yemen, they did a survey, 88% of the people hated Jews. In Libya, 81% of the people hated Jews. Kuwait, 82% of the people hated Jews. Bahrain, 81% of the people hated Jews. All of this unexplained hatred. Many of them said they had never met a Jew. They didn't know a Jew, didn't know a Jewish family. But I hate them. Well, how do you explain this unexplained hatred against Israel and the Jewish people? But out of that survey, listen to that, 70%, 70%, over three-fourths had never ever met a Jewish person. It's a hatred without a cause. And so I mentioned to you earlier about Hamas there in Lebanon, and uh, they had a conflict early this morning at the Lebanese border. And what were they calling for? In their own literature, they called for a second Holocaust. And uh, the Russians were asked, why were you uh, claiming denazifying the Ukraine when you invaded them? when Zelensky himself is a Jew. And you're saying you're fighting Nazism, but you're killing a Jewish leader and trying to kill his people. 
uh, what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, that the Jews are in the middle of all these arguments and, and you've got to know that it's the word of God. It's not going to be our source. It's going to be our truth. And, uh, and you need to realize this. Uh, he responded back about Adolf Hitler. Uh, and I, I don't want to take time to go through all of those. But let me go to this, what Hitler used to use. We'll accelerate a couple of slides there, Andrew, to go to number 30. It says that Hitler himself used this word, rotten. He used the Jew as a political ploy, called them vermin and lice and animals that to, are to be exterminated and removed from society. And while I was in Europe, I saw a revival of this cartoon work and drawing. I saw kids wanting to be like Hitler, drawing Nazis on their body and on their clothing. And in 1939, 16.6 million Jews were in the world right before Hitler. And after the Holocaust, the genocide of the European Jew, we know that 6 to 11 million, according to the Washington Post research, of those Jews were killed. They went from almost 17 million to almost 10 million in one war. Now at 2020, the latest figures, I was able to get a hold of the total population of the world it's only back up to 14 million. There was an effort to get rid of the Jew. And there was a hatred that's gone on for centuries. We know from the book of Esther, we know that in 165 BC, we know that uh, Jews were trying to be uh, uh, eliminated by Antiochus Epiphanes and the festival of Hanukkah. There was an eradication of Jews. We know in Jeremiah 31, 3, we have the God answering all these cultures and societies. And what did God say to the Jewish people? Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Why would God say that? Because this was the element of illustration of grace and mercy. He chose a little people group. He chose a special people to show his love for the grace and his love for mercy that would be given and extended to fallen men. And the teaching tool was that little nation of Israel. Don't forget this going home. A classic struggle. Good versus evil. If you haven't put it in your notes, put it in your notes. Seal it somewhere in the margin of your Bible. It's Satan. He's anti-God. And that evil of today is anti-God. Ephesians 6.11 says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And you, you say, well, Brother Ralph, it's almost like people, I try to explain it and they don't listen, they don't understand. Write this verse down, it'll help you going forward. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 4. This will help you dealing with family and friends. You, that's why you can't do it. God has to do it. And whom the God, little G-O-D, do you see that? That's that evil, little G-O-D. The God of this world hath blinded, is it the eye? No, he blinded what? The minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, you're a witness to spiritual warfare like never before. You're in the middle of it. And that's what we read about in Ephesians 6. And we know that that warfare is raging today. You're a witness to a Bible that is a living, breathing organism and talking about the warfare of today. And Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, God promised he was coming back and he is coming back. Acts chapter one, verse 11. This same Jesus, he's coming back. Don't forget Genesis 49, 10. The hatred of Israel is another proof that our Redeemer is coming. Genesis 49, 10 talks about until Shiloh comes. And that's the Messiah. Go to Jude 14 in your notes. And remember this. It says, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Amen. He's coming back and he's bringing them. And don't forget that Ephesians 6, 12 We've talked about it. You write it down. 
Here's your going home verse, Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. You want God to bless you? You honor his word and you honor these people. And what did God say for us to do? To pray for them. To pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for the Messiah to come. Father, seal your word, seal the promises of your word. And God, I pray today individually and I pray with my church family, we pray today for Jesus to return, the Messiah. We pray for the peace, for there to be a lasting peace in Jerusalem. And God, we pray for the temple to be built that they can see the living Lord of their salvation. Thank you for this time of study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. Thank you for being with us today. I cannot tell you how much it means to me and to the ministry to have you for a prayer partner. Thank you so much. If you happen to be watching today, you were surfing channels and you just came across our programming, I want to let you know that our best friend, my best friend, and will be your best friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you need the Lord today, there are people standing by to pray with you. Call the 800 number on your screen. Go to our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube. All of them have ways to contact us. We have some free literature we'll mail to you about your first steps of faith as we welcome you into the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look up to heaven and say, God, be merciful unto me, sinner. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you for your prayers, your support, and don't forget to share this location We'll see you next time together. God bless you. It's my prayer.